so let me tell you, before I, before I introduce our guest speaker, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Morton Margolin, whose picture is up here. Um, Morton Margolin was a lifelong journalist who reported on business and economics and received a number of awards and a great deal of recognition during his 35-year career as a journalist in Colorado. He spent the bulk of his career at the Rocky Mountain News. Some of you may have been around during that time. Does anybody remember the Rocky Mountain News? Some of the students do? <laughs> Some of us remember the Rocky Mountain News. Um, and he also worked at the Colorado Business Magazine, which is, which is still in some form, um, and which he helped to found. And Margolin was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize when he produced a series of news stories in 1952 that exposed controversial U.S. reclamation <laughs> projects in the central Wyoming area of Riverton. Riverton is the area that is home to the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. And the U.S. government um, asserted a right to claim the land in the tribe's Pumpkin Buttes area around that time, and Margolin reported on it. Um, and he said that there was, uh, the reason for the reclamation was because there was uranium that could be mined. And so Margolin was able to highlight through journalism the fact that business interests were influencing governmental decisions. And debates about the sovereignty in the area have raged on for years, in part because of Margolin's reporting. In fact, it wasn't until 2013 that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency finally ruled that Riverton had be been a part of the Wind River Reservation for the past 108 years. And that ruling gave the tribes the right to measure the air and qu water quality in the region, and thus gave them recognition of their rights to the land. But this isn't a debate that's settled. In February of 2018, um, one of the co local courts ruled that the city of Riverton and surrounding areas were not part of the Wind River Reservation and that the EPA had overreached in recognition of Native American sovereignty over Riverton. And in June of last year, the, court, the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld that decision. So the tribes believe that this ruling diminishes their taxation, their criminal justice authority, and their water rights. And Morton Margolin is a person who certainly would have had something to report about the current situation. And we hope that there are others in the journalism profession who are now following this story as closely as he once did. So this is the fifth year of the Morton Margolin family's support to bring a distinguished lecturer to campus in order to inspire future generations of business, economics, journalism, and international studies leaders in the honor of Morton Margolin's legacy. And I'm pleased that th we have the members of the Mar Morton Margolin family here, and we know that Morton Margolin's son David and his daughter-in-law Denise Reed Margolin, along with Denise's son and Morton Margolin's grandson Ben, have sent their regrets that they were not able to join us this year and, and send their best wishes. But we do thank the family for their continued um, support of excellence in journalism, and, and, and we remember the legacy that your father has left for us. And so now I want to introduce you to you our speaker for this afternoon. Um, Bill Arkin is an award-winning journalist and author and commentator whose reporting has appeared on the front pages of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times. And also he's been a reporter with Vice News and Gawker. Um, he served as a military analyst for NBC News in various capacities for somewhat, something like 30 years. After working in Army intelligence in Cold War Berlin at the beginning of his career, he worked as a military advisor to several NGO and environmental organizations, including Greenpeace International and the Natural Resource Defense Council, and also served as a consultant for the U.S. Air Force. He's authored or co-authored more than a dozen books, including Top Secret America, The Rise of the New American Security State, American Coup, How a Terrified Government is Destroying the Constitution, and most recently, Unmanned, Drones, Data, and the Illusion of the Perfect War. Bill is currently finishing another book that had its start when he resigned from NBC News at the beginning of 2019, and some of you may remember the news story. He, wrote, he resigned by writing a 2,238-word memo to his colleagues Sorry, 2,228-word memo. I, I'm sorry, I don't have my reading glasses with me. So, and I want to be accurate because I'm speaking and introducing a journalist who is very keen on details. <laughs> um, so he wrote this, this memo to his colleagues saying that his time at NBC had been gratifying, but that he also, in that memo, bluntly expressed his displeasure at what he called the Trump circus. U.S. foreign policy failures also came into criticism and the state of television news. The memo that he wrote went viral and resulted in an invitation by Simon & Schuster to write up his argument, which is what he's going to discuss with us today and will be published in time, we hope, for the 2020 election. 
Our national security establishment, he argues, has greater power in how, where, and when we fight than does the president or Congress or US people ourselves. And the news media with their char charges to report minute by minute in order to garner audiences and advertising dollars to keep their efforts going are caught up in the system to the point that they're overwhelmed and he argues neutered. In the brief time that I've had an opportunity to talk with Bill, I've been impressed by the depth of his analytical abilities and his concern for the future of this country and our world. But mostly I've been impressed that even when the deep insights that he's gleaned might lead so many others to despair, he has an unfailing optimism because of his belief in the American people. Last week, the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies and the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here at the University of Denver partnered to put on a symposium on ISIS featuring prominent scholars of ISIS, Muslims, and the media. And so this week is a fitting follow-up to that event as our Morton Margolin Distinguished Lecturer has long been a proponent of the idea that terrorism will never be defeated until we begin to understand why terrorists are driven to fighting. And through his journalism and commentary, Mr. Arkin has expressed grave concern that the US news media are inadequately covering the ways that our military actions have failed us and in fact have perpetuated what he calls the Trump circus and our own perpetual war. So now please join me in welcoming to the podium our 2019 Morton Margolin lecturer, Dr. Mr. Bill Arkin. So there are three basic rules of speaking for me. Uh, one is know your audience, and two is entertain, and three, for me, really important, don't curse too much. <laughs> so I once spoke at this Rotary Club luncheon in central Vermont, and while I was waiting to speak, I observed this ritual amongst the members of the club. They practice this ritual of giving a dollar to the sergeant at arms every time they wanted to share something or every time they said some dirty word like darn. And um, I knew I was in trouble. So after I was introduced and I got ready to speak, I handed a $20 bill to the sergeant at arms and said this should about cover it. And then I cursed like a sailor and everyone, everyone was entertained. But there was another time that I was speaking and it was at one of the war colleges. And I was dropping F-bombs like I was in World War II. And some part of me thought that I was just fitting in with the audience, that I was cursing away like any military officer would do. But then afterwards, the general in charge came up to me, and he admonished me. He said that perhaps I should clean up my act. And that incident, it stuck with me, because I've had similar run-ins with the military over the years. And I thought to myself, do I really just have a potty mouth? Or does this, shall we say, this stylistic control of speech have a bigger meaning? And I'm all for respectful language, the kind that recognizes race and gender. But this is about something else. This is not just about how we speak, but it's also about what we have to say. And I want you to know that I have a long history with the military, over 40 years, and a long history with this national security establishment. And I'm thinking that maybe this very small segment of our society are signaling to me that somehow I was lacking character, that maybe I was just a little bit too vulgar, and maybe I was a little bit too disorderly of a citizen. And I know what the counter-argument of all this is that my message, whatever that is, is more strongly received if I don't curse, if I moderate my language. And I know what my mom used to say, that you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. And yet, I didn't want to conform in my speaking to the military audience, and I never have. And part of why I'm here in Denver, frankly, is because I said get you know what, to NBC News. And though I might have done it nicely and I didn't curse, I did speak up. And I didn't seek the center in what I had to say. And I certainly didn't keep my mouth shut. And that brings me back to the subject of the talk today, to the news media, and even to national security. Because the message I took away then from that general 
and I've heard so many times since, is that I was vulgar and a little bit too loud and a little bit too demanding, that somehow in speaking up and speaking out, that I was jeopardizing something, jeopardizing my membership in some club. And that got me thinking that maybe not just political mouth like, mouth, loudmouths like me are shut out, but that others would be shut out if the opportunity arose as well. That there are those who are subtly shut out. And here I mean like Bernie Sanders or Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, that they were and would be shut out, that they weren't acceptable in some way. And what do I mean when I say weren't acceptable? Well, not acceptable because they're not mainstream enough. And maybe not true blue American enough. Or maybe that we could all be marginalized by this self-appointed conduct police that maybe being socialist or brown-skinned or activist or advocate, that these were stamps of disapproval that came out of Washington. So let's remember, when we do live in a country where there are pledges of allegiance, I don't mean the Pledge of Allegiance, I mean there are things that we are expected to say, that we're forced to say, forced to believe and behave. So we're allowed to criticize the wars, but we can't criticize the troops. That's a big one. We have to accept the proposition that we have to give up some liberties in order to have security. That's another big one. Or this one that I find most curious today, that if we're, quote, not guilty, then we don't have anything to worry about when it comes to government surveillance. Wink, wink. That only they need to worry. The connotation, of course, being that we don't want to be they, whoever they are, but also that they are lurking within our midst. And I've watched this national security clergy evolve this argument this conduct police. They are the custodians of what they consider to be our enduring country. They are the referees of what is acceptable. It's up to them to decide what is politically correct. Not the politically correct of the campus of equal rights, but more a definition that's somewhere stuck in the 1950s of what's politically correct a white American definition of what's politically correct, a Cold War definition of what's politically correct, a post 9-11 definition of what's politically correct that says that anyone who doesn't behave in a certain way, that they are disrupting America and thus they are a threat. And there's one more thing about these guardians of national security. They believe with their oaths and their professional creeds and their ways of bland bureaucracy and centrism, that they own the ideals of our country, that they own the values, that polite society is supposed to follow their lead. Now, I know it'll grate on some in this audience that I'm going to now mention Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Donald Trump in the same sentence. But I believe that this national security establishment sees them both in the same way. For the past two years, I've been watching this weird dynamic form, not just in the news media, but also in society. Donald Trump is so scary that even some in Congress want to pass legislation that would prevent the President of the United States from pushing the nuclear button without their approval. It's an insane and unworkable idea, but these are also insane times. And the search for constraints on Donald Trump's power have also led many, many too many, to look to the FBI or the so-called deep state to save the country from this man and liberals who would otherwise hate the CIA and the FBI 
They're waiting for Robert Mueller to somehow save them from him. And now they hang on every word that a bunch of retired generals and CIA officials turned pundits on TV have to say about Donald Trump. And who are these commentators who fill the airwaves? Well, to me, they're the people who brought us 18 years of war, perpetual war. They are the failed practitioners of their own craft. These are the same people who missed 9-11 in the first place, who concocted the, F the WMD falsehoods that led us into the Iraq war, who missed the Arab Spring, who didn't recognize ISIS forming, who condoned torture, or who carried out a drone campaign that was little more than aerial assassination. They can't say that the world is more secure today because of their work, and yet they have a virtual monopoly and are listened to because they don't curse, because they are judicious, because they are centrist, because they are the custodians of our national security or something bigger and more important. These former Obama, Bush, and Clinton officials are practically all we hear from when we hear the mainstream media. And that's a huge and growing problem, not just because there isn't any other voice being heard, particularly when it comes to national security. There is no other voice. And I know that a lot of this is just autopilot, and these people are supposed to say whatever it is they're supposed to say to fill the airwaves and entertain the public but they also are the ar arbiters of proper behavior. They guard against the Bernie Sanders and the AOCs of the world. They exclude anyone who doesn't comport with the mainstream and with their ways of Washington. I don't think that this is a conspiracy, by the way. Donald Trump sells. He's the story. He's the only person in our society who seems to have cracked the social media code, and he has dominated. And by the way, just systemically, it's inexpensive to put on the Trump story night after night in the same way with the same people. And that means you don't have to conduct any, no, any real long-term investigations. There's hardly any expense of any travel because he doesn't like to go anywhere. It can, you can just sit in a studio and yell all day and night there's no incentive to get off of the Trump story. There's no incentive to hear any fresh voices like somebody from the university or from the academic community or the religious community or any other community. There's no incentive to do any other stories. Now, I know I'm being a little bit unfair to television, but I'm intentionally being so to make a point. The mainstream in our society, it's shrinking. The debate is limited. The state of perpetual war isn't even the subject of basic coverage in the news today. It's, it's so hard to generalize about what America thinks. But I believe that most think that Donald Trump needs to be stopped. And a part of that is that some center some moderate middle ground, some vanilla of America needs to be restored. That's the reasonable center, the conventional wisdom center, the non-confrontational center, the non-cursing center. And I hesitate even to say it again, the white center. But still, the point is, center is the key word of what I'm going to talk about. And that gets me back to these military officers, to the national security establishment, and how they treat our elected president. Let me get back to them and the national security establishment, because I'm asserting that that might be how they would treat a socialist who was president, too, or a leftist, or a peacenik. If anyone of that type could even get elected to national public office, wouldn't the national security establishment marginalize and treat them in the same way? So the good news is that Donald Trump as president is not really in charge of anything. 
at the most extreme end, even if he wanted to push the nuclear button, he'd not only have to find it and figure out how it works, <laughs> but I'm absolutely sure that he's also surrounded by these very military officers and others in the bureaucracy who possess this moral superior view of both decorum and procedure. In other words, the powers that be have their own survival plan, and it is to protect the country as much as from Donald Trump as it would be from AOC. I'm absolutely sure that most in government, most in Washington, absolutely disdain what Donald Trump is, how he has behaved. And though they work every day to thwart him, to passive-aggressively slow roll him, or to even ignore him until he forgets about something and then just moves on, we shouldn't be happy that these guardians exist. They don't decide how we vote, though by setting the parameters of the debate, they do limit our choices. And now that there's even been a black man as president, and then this off-center buffoon, the powers that be, and maybe they can't see it themselves, deeply want to return to something else. And I'll get back to that in a moment. So because I'm here at a university, I'm allowed to like speak in this way for a moment, that the core idea of liberty is the precept that a free society is one of laws, not of men. And that the rule of law stands above the whims or the beliefs of any empowered group. In our society, the precept is undermined by this governance by the national security nannies, whether they be permanent Washington or the so-called deep state. To them, it doesn't really matter if Donald Trump is president, or for that matter, if Barack Obama is president. They can be outwardly cordial to both, but these special emergency managers still control because they are empowered to control. Obama wasn't able to make progress in actually ending perpetual war, in actually advancing nuclear disarmament or transparency, because he was either brought into the center for acceptance or because it was too hard to take on the national security establishment and get at what else he wanted to get done, or because they had by, to, by 2009 acquired so much power that they were invulnerable to change. And I wrote about this actual state of emergency special managers in my book, American Coup, about how the national security apparatus, empowered what, by what I call the XYZs of the extraordinary, had grown out of 9-11 in the state of perpetual war. What did I mean by the XYZs? It's the framework that stands in opposition of the ABCs, the government of laws, the one that we take too often for granted. The national security establishment, this bureaucracy, this class of special emergency managers, they're able to control policy on a national scale because they perpetrate, and then they benefit from a continuing state of emergency. Their power is contingent on extraordinary security circumstances, and those circumstances never end. They have become, become self-sustaining, a shadow government, a shadow legal system, and one that I wrote was commensurate to a bloodless coup. This state of perpetual emergency, of threat, and of panic is the necessary precondition for this American coup to exist. We have that in perpetual war and in the constant specter that we are fed that some thin line of their security efforts barely separates us from another 9-11. But we also have it now in addition in this threat of cyber everything from election hacking to our own personal identity theft, or you could even substitute climate change into this sentence. 
any ubiquitous threat with apocalyptic outcome. It describes a world that is so terrifying and out of our control that we ultimately need to turn it over to the technocrats of this class. This is not one political party I'm talking about. These are the apparent experts who populate federal bureaucracies and they supposedly know better than the rest of us and resident within their knowing better and protecting the country is, I believe, a basic contempt for the citizens. This elite sees ordinary Americans as the other to be watched and suppressed. And I would say Donald Trump is part of that other. He's an awful president and an awful human being as well. And basically the national security establishment feels like they need to keep an eye on him. But I'm most interested in ultimately knowing how Donald Trump is employed by the national security establishment to disempower the public. Not just how the elite dismisses and vilifies the supporters of Donald Trump, but how Donald Trump's coarseness is broadcast into our society, almost as if it is meant to numb us, conferring him with greater power and yet at the same time really making us want to yearn for the center. And it ultimately necessitates our return to some golden era of civility and bipartisanship and centrism where the national security establishment is there too, even on TV, whether you realize it or not. So when there's a Charlottesville or there's another attack on a church or a temple or a mosque, these events become law enforcement problems and then homeland security problems and then even national security problems. We want them to do something about the hate, about the violence. We want the national security community to save us. So today, like what do we want them to do? We want them to do something about white nationalism, about right-wing violence. We want them to do something, and that becomes the license for the federal government to snoop and interfere. And you might think that that's good and warranted and needed, but tomorrow, the flip side of this same behavior is that Black Lives Matter become under the federal microscope. Or, as I said earlier, a socialist candidate for president or an AOC. They're to be suspected, marginalized, to be labeled off-center and thus dismissed. And they will say, those commentators and the dinosaur television watchers will say, that we need to return to some simpler time to a time when three television networks and a handful of newspapers didn't just report and control the news, but they filtered the news. They filtered what the public needed to know and what we needed to buy and what we were allowed to see. And in journalism, that even includes a systemic effort on the part of the national security establishment to make sure that any new voices are suppressed. I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Julian Assange. He's in the news. You all know the story. But they want to turn him into a common criminal to deny him the protections of freedom of speech. And this effort began even before WikiLeaks became a partner with Russia in trying to undermine and interfere in American politics. And it will have lasting effect long beyond Julian Assange, whatever you think about him. They want to decide what the public can know. They want to have control over who talks. Again, there's so much more to say about Assange, but I want to just focus on what ties Bernie Sanders, AOC, Donald Trump, and Julian Assange together. In January, I left NBC News, saying that the planet and the state of journalism were in a tandem crisis. For more than a year, 
I had declined to report on the Trump circus, and I tried to do news stories that I thought were more consequential. Stories about the day-to-day war-making of the United States, about the secrets and power of our government. Holding the government accountable. When I left, I took a pot shot of the, at the national security establishment and at our military leaders because I thought it was high time that we held them accountable. Accountable for the fact that there was not one country in the Middle East that could say it was safer in 2019 than it was 18 years ago. In fact, I said, the world overall becomes ever more polarized and dangerous every day as a result of their efforts. And yet no one seems responsible, particularly not those responsible for managing the world. I said, and I believe, that there is not a soul in Washington who can say that they have won or stopped any conflict since 9-11. And I asked why, if they've done so little of consequence, that we embrace them, even look up to them and lionize them and put them on TV and listen to them. I said I was especially disheartened to watch the news media somehow become a defender of this creed, of this class, this Washington establishment, this fraudulent system of insecurity. To me, the mainstream news media has become the proxy of boring moderation and conventional wisdom, the agent, if you will, of that national security order. It has become the defender of our poor little government against Donald Trump. It has become the cheerleader for every threat imaginable. It seems more in love with procedure and protocol than it is with accountability and results. My view is that the news media has gotten sucked into this tweeting vortex, increasingly lost in an adrenaline rush of Donald Trump, in love with the political horse race, reporting on every shift and change, no matter how consequential, because it's kind of become the latest car crash or the latest snowstorm. It's just on a never-ending loop. In many ways, NBC and others in the mainstream, they're just emulating the national security state. And what do I mean by that? Well, they're very busy and they're very profitable. No wars are won, but the ball is kept in play. So even without Donald Trump, our biggest challenge as we move forward is that if we have become exhausted by this endless media, and because of the news cycle, all of journalism suffers from a really bad case of not even being able to take a breath. I realized how out of, out of step I was when I looked at Trump's various half-baked ideas of what we should do in the world. His desire to improve relations with Russia, to denuclearize North Korea, to get American military forces out of the Middle East, to question why we're even fighting in Africa, even his attacks on the intelligence community and the FBI. Of course, Donald Trump is an ignorant and incompetent imposter. And yet, I'm alarmed at how quickly the powers that be mechanically argue the contrary of whatever it is that Donald Trump offers. And the end result of it is that we don't get to ask the questions. Shouldn't we get out of Syria? Shouldn't we go for the bold move of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula? Even on Russia. Though we should be concerned about the brittleness of our democracy, that it is so vulnerable to manipulation, do we really yearn for another Cold War? So let me speak for a minute to the students in the audience. Whatever your political affiliations are, and either, even whether you want to be journalists or not, I want you to know that I also believe that you can make a difference. I don't mean the blah, blah, blah of you are the future and let's all hold hands. <laughs> you can make a difference because we are really stuck right now. And things do change. 
And that's seen in the work of Morton Margolin. So when I looked him up to prepare myself for this lecture, I saw that he also wrote about the military in Colorado. And in 1958, 61 years ago, he wrote about the move of the Air Force Academy from Denver to Colorado Springs. So I found an article that he wrote in the Rocky Mountain News in April 1958. The headline was, not making this up, Love Struck Cadets Don't Relish Move. It seemed that in the words of Margolin, quote, many of the cadets are engaged to Denver girls and both the boys and their fiancés would much rather stay in Denver. Apparently this was a serious enough matter that the local congressman said, and again I quote because I can't make this up, well the superhighway between Denver and the academy should see considerably more traffic after the move. And the congressman in Colorado Springs, not to be outdone, said not to worry because, quote, the feminine enrollment at Colorado College was sharply up for next fall, <laughs> given the new crop of boys. Then an Air Force general is quoted as saying not to worry because, quote, all the eligible Denver girls will be married as soon as the first class graduates. Those words, feminine, girls, eligible, those words great on our ears. And that shows us that things have really changed. And yet in that article, is the same subtle offering that whatever was the definition of eligible in 1958, that military officers were the prize. There's no gay here. There's no inequality or matters of class. This is just cute, centered, white, wonderful America. Well, I don't think anyone wants to return to that golden age. And yet, when they, the national security establishment, the old farts of the world, talk about the greatest generation, or when they talk about the great TV anchormen of the past, they are saying to you, your generation, that you're not good enough, that you can't compare that you should strive to be like that. They don't actually intend to constrain you, but they find it inconceivable that anyone would want anything other than some concocted American ideal of what this country once was. What the national security establishment fears most, what all of those who wear a uniform fear, from university police through generals and admirals, is disturbance, variability, and difference. These things are the enemies of those who want to stay in the center. And yet I will say to you today, disturbance, variability, and difference are the things that are the primary drivers of creativity and change. When I was younger, I used to quip, if the Pentagon is for it, I'm against it. It wasn't a factual statement, but it was a position I held. One that said I didn't want to agree, that I didn't want to go along, that I didn't want to be like everyone else. And so, we are a long way away from resolving the rules of the road in this age of instant everything. We're not even able to resolve information overload in our own personal lives. We aren't on some straight line of digital nirvana where the internet and all of this information democratizes or improves our society. Far from it. 
I believe there's smartphone and social media fatigue creeping across our land. And what the news media will look like tomorrow, as far as I'm concerned, it's a wide open case. But I get a sense, largely because of Donald Trump and all of the extremism that he has encouraged and unearthed, that a giant hangover will come when he is gone. And my guess is that nothing we currently see, nothing that is snappy or twitty or chatty, is going to solve the challenges we currently face. The national security nannies will furiously try to reverse the flow back to good old Main Street USA when Donald Trump is done. But you, your role, it seems to me that you have wide open opportunities to design media that matters, and to make real changes in a country that is no longer lily white. Thank you very much. All right, well, we really appreciate um, Bill's talk about disruption. And usually what we do at the end of these lectures is we open the floor, and then the people who are most outspoken and most confident are willing to speak about what their questions are. So what I'd like to propose is that you turn and introduce yourself to a group of people who sit next to you and see if you can get in a group of three to four people um, at least one of whom you maybe didn't know before. So that if you could get into a group of three or four and talk about Bill's comments here and see what it is that you have to ask him as a question. And I want to, I'm going to call on you as, as in your groups to ask some questions. And then also think about and talk with your groups about how you see yourself being disruptive and taking his words forward. So I'm going to give you five minutes to work on those things and then we'll call us back together so that we can ask some questions of Bill. Oh my gosh, so, and I could see some of the words were the same as the things that you've written for yours. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. So hopefully make yeah. their way into the book. Yeah, yeah, so good. I'm glad. I'm glad that I... <laughs> Do you want to join one of the groups? No, I'd rather... Uh, I'll maintain my um, white male authoritarian <laughs> position to the very end. Don't I get to do that? Isn't that the privilege? <laughs> okay. Looks, looks. I think this is a. I recognize a couple of faces in the audience, and I'm wondering from. No, from NBC, maybe. Even. This young man right here, I think I recognize him, but I don't know where. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> it's a great story though, isn't it? Great story. Great story. That was like I had to go deep into his into his writings to find it. But once I realized he wrote about the Air Force Academy, I thought uh, Yeah.
Okay, so if I can call you back in just a few seconds here, wrap up your conversation if you haven't already. So your next challenge is going to be that if you're the person in the group who usually is the first person to speak whenever the person in the front of the room says, now it's time for your team to speak out, just if you could take a step back and encourage the person in the group who maybe didn't say as much or who was quiet to talk on behalf of your group. So I'm going, can you tell I'm an introvert? I'm empowering the introverts in the room. <laughs> so I want to make sure that, that you have an opportunity. And we'll have an opportunity to open the floor as well. So if you have some questions afterwards, to please, uh, I'll, we'll obviously have time for you to talk with Bill about your questions. And he's willing to stay around for a bit, too, to talk with you. But I want to call on some of the groups to see if, we, if you can share with us some of the things that you talked about. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill again so he can call on whichever groups you'd like to hear. And I'm going to try. I'm going to try hard you. not to be too mean to the introverts. <laughs> okay. Okay. First of all, thank you for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask you really quickly about um, sort of you talked about the future of media and how maybe it's us as students, but what it could look like. Um, and so you you touched on how sort of the big wigs in the uh, national security community talk about how we need to go back to the golden age of three broadcast stations and things like that where uh, people get their news and then they can figure it out for themselves what they want to believe. Um, but maybe that's not what we need to be going back to because we can form our own future. Uh, where I come from as a teenager, as a college student, frankly, all I see in the media right now is opposing ideas and stations like Fox News and MSNBC that are really only butting heads and you know pulling people to opposite sides. And so granted, I didn't grow up in the age of Walter Cronkite and Dan Rather and Diane Sawyer, but from my perspective, that seems like <laughs> something that could be good for our society where they get the news and they get the facts and then maybe people can come up with their own ideas. Um, first of all, do you think that that um, that image of media could be something that could be beneficial to go back to or make something that looks similar to it? And if so, how do you think we could go about it? Or if not, what would be a better alternative? Well, I certainly don't believe that there's a, a form that matters. But to me, it's, look, the biggest crisis that we face in our society is that most people don't pay attention to the news. So regardless of what the uh, the news is. I mean, if you only watched Fox News and you came in here and said, I'm a Fox News follower and I like what I see on Fox News, I would say to you, well, at least you watch the news. So let's, let's just look at some numbers to understand even what we're talking about. When Rachel Maddow goes on TV at night, that's the number one cable news show, she has a million households on a good night. That's a million out of 110 million households. That's less than 1% of our society. So we're literally talking about less than 1%. And I can't imagine that there's anybody who's watching that isn't already in agreement with her. So to me, the problem is not necessarily that, the, that MSNBC exists or has decided that it wants to be a liberal counterpart to, to Fox. The problem is that less than 1%. And then, and then second, um, that there was a reason uh, it, it, when broadcast first began that uh, the, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, decided that it wanted to regulate what was said over the airwaves. It, it wanted to regulate what was said over the airwaves because uh, it was broadcast to everyone. So they had to regulate that you couldn't curse, and they had to regulate that you couldn't be overtly partisan political and they had to regulate that you had to be balanced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, those rules were made in the 1940s. So maybe the first thing we need to do is update our, both our aesthetic and our idea of what it is that should be regulated, if anything, if anything, if anything. I'm not making an argument for regulation. But there were ideals that were um, thought through when broadcast television began. And I don't know if we have those ideals today when it comes to news that is not constrained by medium. What I mean by that is, to me, it doesn't matter if it's on the internet or if it's on 
broadcast or it's on radio. It, it, it's, it's all the news. It's all journalism. It should, it should operate from some professional standard, and the professional standard should probably be determined by those who are in the profession. That there should, that, 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 isn't that the very definition of a profession, that there is a, a set of standards under which you operate? I, I'm all in favor of that. I don't think that I intend in doing that to say that the gawkers of the world can't exist. I, I don't tend, intend to say that, that, that everybody has to sound like NPR, which, to tell you the truth, drives me insane. Uh, but I do think that the crisis that we face is twofold. One, that so few people pay attention. Pay attention to the, po the political status of our country, let alone the world. And number two, uh, that we haven't really been able to resolve the fundamental economic reality of broadcasting, which is that it costs. And either you're going to have to make your advertisers happy, or you're going to have to make your corporate owners happy. And that applies as much to Gawkers as it does to NBCs. Don't, don't kid yourself. When 250 journalists are fired at BuzzFeed, they're fired because they didn't make the money. So we haven't resolved that. There are ProPublicas out there, but even they are dependent upon foundation support. So is there a subscription model that works? I know that NPR likes to say they are dependent upon their viewers, but NPR is a gigantic consumer of corporate sponsorship, from Lockheed Martin all the way down to the pharmaceutical companies. Now, does that affect them their editorially? I doubt it. But it does say that ultimately, if you don't report within the parameters of of, of, of the mainstream. You're not going to get funding. So we have to resolve the question of how do you get more people to pay attention to the news? And then second, how do you pay for it? And, uh, and, and there are, like in Northern European countries as an example, people pay a, a television tax. Now that's not really very valuable anymore because nobody needs a television. But I could see where there could be a, a, a set of micropayments that would be used to say regulate that every time you look at your smartphone, you're, you're paying 0.1 penny to a, a broadcasting and journalism fund that then gets distributed amongst creation of news. 0.1 penny. You know, that's a lot of money when you're talking about hundreds of millions of eyeballs. So I, I think that there might be creative models for the future. I haven't really seen them. And one of the things that's really happened with Donald Trump, as I said in my talk, is that the polarization that he has created, that the news media has perpetuated and showcased, um, has set us back. Like five years ago, People were worried that Vice News and Gawker and BuzzFeed were the future, that they were creeping up on the mainstream media. Now, I don't think anybody's worried about that anymore. Now, NBC is rolling in money. And uh, New York Times is even rolling in money. They may not be putting all that money into editorial, but they're rolling in money. So, so, so first we have to get over the Trump hangover. And then we have to think clearly about what it is we want the news media to do, because ultimately, if we're honest with ourselves, we're going to come to the conclusion that the news media played an incredibly important role in bringing us Donald Trump in the first place. Next question. <clears throat> Here we go. 
Oh, we're live streaming. Hello, Hello. everyone. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, you opened by talking about cursing and how these codes of acceptability stand to limit participation or credibility uh, within academia and government, I suppose you could say. Um, so given that and given the guidelines of code switching and the requirements for certain vernacular and politeness and et cetera, et cetera, um, when you combine that with this idea of being disruptive and how that is a goal for uh, many of us young journalists. How do you balance um, critiques that you are too disruptive? And what can you do when you're faced um, with being framed in that way? Well, I would like to be able to say to you that, uh, that there are mediums available to you that are going to accommodate disruption no matter how disruptive it is. And in the era of the existence of Gawker as Gawker, or Huffington Post as Huffington Post, um, and many uh, specialized and, and, and now extremely marginalized news sites, uh, I would have said that. So there has been, there have been times when it's been accommodated. Um, I, I find it encouraging that that exists. I'm not sure that I could say to you, however, that, and I say this as somebody even who worked at Gawker, that anything that Gawker ever wrote meant a hill of beans in terms of changing anything about the world. But, but, the, but the mere existence of, of well, I guess what we used to call counterculture is, is, is important. Um, I think that here's where we're really going to be in crisis. Like, there's already an NBC out, and an NBC Latino, and an NBC, uh, you know, there's always these, these verticals, as we call them, in the business. So when there becomes NBC disrupt, we know we're in trouble. Because uh, then the corporation has really taken over everything. Uh, there are examples, there are not many, but there are examples of where people have transitioned from their own blogs and Twitter to, uh, into the mainstream. They, they sort of are given their chance to, to speak. Uh, there are people who uh, are, are extremely disruptive uh, in the national security field. They think of Glenn Greenwald as an example. Uh, uh, and he gets his um, audition on TV every once in a while, but most of the time he's, he, he, he's not invited back. Uh, but, I, but I think it, it, it shows that there's a possibility. I, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm more optimistic because I think that when Trump is gone, a lot of the digital news media will also be gone. So if the BuzzFeeds of the world, the Axioses and the Voxes can't sustain themselves economically under Trump, they're certainly not going to be able to sustain themselves economically post-Trump. So there is going to be a shakeout. And in that shakeout, I think there's a, a potential for something new to emerge. What it's going to be, I'm not quite sure. I would have liked to have seen the gawkers of the world, the vices of the world, really focus more energy on being real experts on government, on national security, on culture, et cetera, than just being commentators on their own armpits. Uh, and to me, that's like the key. That's what I said to the class this morning. That's my overall message, that expertise is really crucial. And if young journalists don't develop some form of expertise, then I don't think they really have an entree into uh, the news media. And, 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 and I'll say one more thing, because I, I want to encourage young journalists. I, don't, I write really badly. 
You know, and you're talking to a guy who's written more than a dozen books and thousands of articles. I'm not a great writer. You know, when I see a Rick Atkinson or I see a, a you know, somebody who's just a, can put words together in a, in a, in a magical way, I, I, I'm, I'm in awe. I know that there is a lot of young energy out there that's trying to do that. And there will be a few that will be selected to go on to be the next New Yorker writer or the next, uh, you know, great writer. And then they can write about their armpits and it's actually interesting. <laughs> but for most of us mere mortals, journalism is a slog. It's, 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 it's writing the article and getting the sourcing right and, 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 and not plagiarizing, which is really difficult in the modern era, since the first thing that journalism, oh God, do we still teach this today? Go look at the clips? Okay, so my first thing is don't look at the clips. Do journalism without looking at the clips, because that's just repeating what's already been repeated. But I think that it doesn't take great writing. It takes expertise. And, I, and I'm hopeful that a combination of expertise with a wide open medium will allow us to design something for the future. And, uh, and you know, maybe there's a Bill Gates sitting in this audience today. Because I really believe that, uh, that if somebody can solve the problem and the and the conundrum, not the problem, the conundrum of putting news into a two and a half inch by two and a half inch screen, uh, that they will make a lot of money. But what that looks like, I don't think is just a miniature version of putting it onto a 60 inch screen. I, I think it's something different. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. And we see a little bit of the genesis of it in podcasting. We see a little bit of the genesis of it in in, the, in what I'll call the vice model of, of video. I, I, we see a little bit of it in, in, in you know, very personalized journalism. And we see a little bit of it in also non-bylined journalism, which I also like. So I know that there's possibilities, but we'll have to see who the, who the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs in this audience is. Next. Oh, I don't want to do that. You're the teacher. You go do it. How about that back area over there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go. Yeah, hi. I'm Russell. Um, I wouldn't really consider myself an introvert, but I'm still here to ask a question. Um, so at the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that um, people like Bernie and AOC will always be shut out, and it's no secret that the media like tended to suppress Bernie Sanders' views in both 2016, and it seemed to be a trend in 2020. I was wondering if you um, feel that that is true, that the media does genuinely try to suppress him, and what your experiences were with that. Well, first of all, first of all, as I said, there's no conspiracy afoot. Uh, you know, it, it, does Bernie Sanders get 16 percent of Democratic America worth of news coverage? If we consider that Democratic America is 59 percent and Republican America is 49%. So does he get 16% of 51%? My guess would be that if you made an empirical study, the answer would be he does. So what I'm talking about more is that they can't really do it without saying socialist Bernie Sanders, right? And, and they can't do AOC without saying the young upstart who has disrupted and disturbed and annoyed everyone, right? So it's the adjective. It's, it, it, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the time. You're probably not old enough to remember the Howard Dean meltdown. I was in the studio that day. And um, uh, Chris Matthews, 
Oh wait, am I live streamed? Yes, asshole. Um, <laughs> when when Howard Dean said what he said, he'd like went yeehaw when, when he wa was announced that he had won a primary. I, the news media killed the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they killed him. They there was like, oh, that's not the proper decorum for somebody who wants to be president. Well, you know what? He they didn't like him because he was against the Iraq war, because he'd been the governor of Vermont, because he was too liberal, etc. That was just the excuse. And so I'm saying that the excuse is always gonna be found that changes the coverage. And it's not concocted by some corporate office in New York. It's the presumption of the Chris Matthews of the world who are there to protect us from ourselves. And, and here's where I, 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 I can't give a talk without contradicting myself, so here I'm going to go. If, if Bernie Sanders got more press coverage, nobody would want to vote for him as president. That's my view. I, I say that as a 25-year resident of Vermont. As somebody who knows him. If Donald Trump got more media coverage in 2016, no one would have wanted to vote for him either. And yet empirically, we know now that because of the email dumps and the campaign and the way it shook out, that there was more negative coverage of Hillary Clinton than there was of Donald Trump because the elite believed that Donald Trump was never going to be president. But yet, had there been more coverage of him, had half the stories that came out in 2017 come out in 2016, maybe he would have never been elected. So I'm all for more coverage. And the way in which those decisions are made that decides that there should be less coverage are intrinsically inimical to what is our interest. So I'm saying to you, I don't think Bernie Sanders would be elected if there were more coverage of him. I don't think Donald Trump would have been elected if there were more coverage of him. So to me, the outcome is, is good on both sides. Because I don't think a 78-year-old white guy should be the next president of the United States. So I think that it comes down to, and I said this earlier in journalism class, that the, we don't really have a strategic view of the, of the news. When I say a strategic view, I mean not that there's an editorial meeting that takes place every day that says, what's going to be on the front page tomorrow? Because then you're already in the limited range of what the stories are for today. But more like a strategic view that says, OK, when we go and start uh, uh, covering the 2020 election, we're going to give equal time to Democrats and Republicans. Now, that's tricky. Because now you've got 20 Democratic candidates and one Republican candidate. How do you give them equal time? So I'm the Jimmy Olsen in the back of the room, and I'm going to say, OK, Chief, how are we going to do that? And he's going to say, I don't care. Go out and do some investigations of Donald Trump. But the reality is that in our coverage of the 2020 elections, we're going to give equal coverage. Well, that's bad for Donald Trump. Because what's going to happen is that with 20 candidates out there, you're going to see 90% of the news covering those 20 candidates, peeing on them, saying bad things about them, talking about how they dress, how they, how they act, how they, work, how they look, et cetera, and nothing about Donald Trump, and the nothing about Donald Trump lets him skate by. So if there's anything to be said about Donald Trump that his supporters or potential supporters need to know it needs to be in the news media. And yet, if we don't approach what's in the news media in a strategic way, then I think we influence what people see and hear. And I say the same thing about war. If, if I were the editor of the New York Times and I said to my reporters, we're at war, we're bombing nine countries around the world, every week. I want to see it on the front page of this newspaper every day. I believe it would change the way that Americans would see that we're at war. It would. 
if the nightly news had an obligation as much as they do to write a story about health every night because, because their viewership is over 65 and cares about health, so that's why there's a health story on the news every night. And one night that health story is coffee's bad for you, and the next night it's, oh, it's good for you now, and chocolate's bad for you. No, no, it's good for you. Those are really useful stories, right? What if they had a story about war every night? We're at war. I think it would change the way people saw things. So thinking strategically about what's in the news, like what's important about our society, what's going on, to me that's the solution. I'm, I, 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 I'm an optimist, and I believe in America, that I believe if we did that, that the right outcome would take place. That, that's, that's the most important part. But it's not going to happen through the opposite of your proposition that somehow Bernie Sanders or the Bernie Sanders of the world are being suppressed. I think that we will, that, that as long as the media is structured the way it is, any alternative views are, are suppressed. That's why I put Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders in the same way. They can't ignore Donald Trump. He's president. And Donald Trump has figured out the secret code of social media because he just, he just throws it out there every morning. And we, you know, look, this is how it works, right? Donald Trump gets up every morning. He unzips his pants. We go, oh, my God, did you see what he did? And then guess what? We do the same thing tomorrow. Is it any more meaningful than that? I don't think so. OK, teach. <laughs> what about these professors over here, the, the smart professors over in this corner over here? <laughs> Okay, here we have a professor question. I didn't get introduced to you. Professor. This is Dr. Erica Polson, who is one of our professors. Hi, okay. yeah, I'm Erica Polson, a professor in media, film, and journalism studies. Thanks and welcome. Um, our group talked a little bit about when Barack Obama became president. There was um, a real desire among a lot of people, I think, to see the Iraq war go on trial in the in the Congress, just to get a lot of information out there, like that Saddam Hussein didn't plan 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as you rightly pointed out, one of the reasons he didn't do that is he wanted to tackle other things. But there was this other discourse about civility and healing um, that was used to explain why we shouldn't dive into that. And we were just kind of talking about how healing as an explanation for not uncovering horrible things that we've done is is a really limited, <laughs> it's a really limited thing. So we just love to hear if you have other ideas about how healing can be used in a way that still helps um, more voices come out than just bring us back to the center. It's hmm. a good question. Um, you know, the dynamics of what happened with Obama in 2009 are very complicated, and. Uh, and I can understand why he didn't want to touch Iraq with a 10-foot pole. Uh, but I, I think that ultimately what happened in 2009 is a systemic problem that we were, will face in 2020. Barack Obama became president, and he did not have um, a group of civilian experts that he could appoint to the roles, the positions of Secretary of Defense, of, of National Security Advisor, Director of the CIA, et cetera. So he ended up, uh, and, okay, so and let me just say what happened, then I'll explain why. So he, he ended up appointing a, a National Security Advisor, General Jim Jones, who he had met two weeks before because this was going to give him equal footing with the military. And he ended up keeping Robert Gates, who was the Republican Secretary of Defense, on as his Secretary of Defense, because this was going to create continuity with the last government. And he ended up appointing uh, retired Admiral Dennis Blair, 
as the director of national intelligence, same reason, you know, we need to have professionals. And, uh, uh, and Hillary Clinton, as you know, became Secretary of State, but uh, not a national security expert. And um, uh, Leon Panetta, who had been the Clinton White House Chief of Staff, became the director of the CIA, Washington Paul. And, uh, and really the only person that was in his administration who uh, had thought about national security and had written about it and who was of a different stripe was Samantha Power, uh, who had uh, written a book when she was at Harvard about the Rwanda genocide. And she ended up at the UN. So he didn't have like, oh yeah, Professor So and So at the University of Denver. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, pluck, pluck that professor out to be, to be the Secretary of Defense or to be the National Security Advisor or the Director of the CIA, because frankly, those people didn't exist. So though Barack Obama had a pretty interesting worldview and had a desire for reconciliation and had a civility to him that was really unique, you have to say, and also. Uh, didn't buy into the Iraq or Afghanistan wars, he, he didn't really have anybody to call upon to implement his own vision. Now, to me, that's a, that's a systemic failure of the philanthropic community. Because I can, I can tell you that, uh, that I exist here because uh, the MacArthur Foundation and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and other foundations supported my work when I was a young scholar. And they did so because they supported the work of hundreds of young civilian scholars to be arms control and nuclear weapons experts to counter the military. It was a very specific agenda. And, and that cadre of Cold War nuclear arms control experts saved the planet. I'll assert it. 9-11 happened and those same foundations ran in the other direction. They were scared shitless of terrorism. And so today, we have not even no mechanism to train young scholars to be public policy experts in the field of national security. But instead, what we have is think tank after think tank after focused on national security from a completely pro standpoint. So yeah, you've got, you've got all these think tanks in Washington, but not one of them is of any consequence that's anti-war or anti-military. Our, our, our society suffers. And yet, here's an example of where the, the, that same money is just flowing in the, in the direction of, of what I guess we now think of as a democratic national security versus a Republican national security. But the ideals of the country were civilian control. Civilian control of the military, civilian control in general. And we've lost that civilian control. So when I talk of the generals and the admirals and the national security establishment, it's one. It's one body. And, 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 and if you're a Bill Arkin or you're somebody who is, who is a knowledgeable expert of a different opinion, uh, there's, not, there's not a chance in hell I would ever get a job in the government. And... And so when we see these stories, I, I once said this at an NBC meeting. Uh, you can see why I'm Mr. Popular. And um, <laughs> uh, there was a story about Jared Kushner getting a security clearance. Probably you've all read this story, right? And, um, and so, of course, the NBC story and everybody's story was, oh, how terrible this is. You know, the secrets are going to leak out. And uh, I said, well, you know, if we imagine for a moment that Jesse Jackson were president or somebody else was president and he appointed somebody who was kind of lefty and dodgy as, as his advisor and then the security establishment decided you're not going to get a security clearance, we would be up in arms. Who were they to decide? He's the elected representative of the country of the people, he gets to decide who his advisors are, and he ultimately gets to decide who gets to see the secrets. That's, it's an executive privilege. 
And I said, shouldn't we take into consideration a little bit that this is, like, this is the security establishment saying that Jared Kushner shouldn't get a clearance? Like, aren't we buying into the whole paradigm of, of, of how fucked up this system is? And I just, trust me, I got a sea of cross-eyed, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, and so we have to remind ourselves sometimes that when we talk about the establishment, when we talk about the security establishment, when we talk about Robert Mueller, when we talk about the FBI, when we talk about the CIA, we're not talking about an institution that only does things that are on our behalf and, and in be, on behalf of peace and stability and tranquility. They, they, they operate on their own behalf. That's what we've gotten from 9-11, that they operate on their own behalf. And so we shouldn't wait for them. We need to take this, the, the power. And, and, and I think, in the end, I hope that some of this crop of 2018 young Congress people, that, that, that some of the of those who will be elected on the hangover of Donald Trump uh, decide that they want to take on national security, take on foreign policy, take on these difficult closed communities, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, it's not going to happen without a lot of outside assistance, both from the academy but also from the, from the philanthropic world. And, I, and a big part of what I'm writing about in my book is the need for uh, the, the philanthropic community to support a new generation of anti-terrorism experts, <laughs> anti-cyber anti experts, anti-military experts, because we need them. And, uh, and I, 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 I can really say we need them because, because I, I can really tell you how lonely my voice is sometimes. It's, I mean, my hat's off to NBC that they... Uh, tolerated me for so long, but I produced good news. I produced good investigations. But, but I was always disagreeing with what would be the mainstream view. And so we're talking about a place that has nightly uh, 1,300 journalists and probably 30 or so who handle national security matters and I'm the only one who would come to the story with the presumption of anti-military, anti-national security. The only one. The, that, the, it's just so intrinsically an imbalance. But I think, it can, I think it can be resolved. I would like to see, say, for instance, more. Like, I know that there are, in other areas, in science, in medicine, in the environment, that there are programs that say, OK, we're going to teach journalists how to be science journalists. We're going to teach journalists how to be uh, 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 environmental journalists. Uh, multicultural journalism. We have it right here at the University of Denver, right? We need a national security journalism program, one that can say, OK, when you go out there, you know, what, how, do you, how do you even understand what you're looking at? What's the difference between the Army and the Marine Corps? What's the difference between the Army and the National Guard? You know, what's the bullshit detector that you have that you understand what's going on, what you're watching, what you're seeing? And even in Colorado, you know, I was saying this to Lynn this morning, there are national security stories. You know, the military owns a lot of land in Colorado, and, it, and, and it's a big employer in Colorado. It's a big employer in Denver. What goes on in Aurora? Do you know what goes on there? You know? And how does it affect things? And so there's a local story too, and yet we don't, we don't, we don't pay attention to it. So, so part of the answer, because I'm here talking mostly to journalist students and journalist people, is is to say we 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 got to train those people. We got to train them to be able to do it. Those stories are relevant. It's just not enough to say, oh yeah, Lockheed Martin employs all these people in Aurora to do well. I want to know secret. It's like, you know what, it's not secret. And the cog that, is, that they play, it's important, and then engages more people in the story. And if you can say that Colorado is relevant to the, to the NSA story, it's relevant to the government surveillance story, it's relevant to the, 
to the question of freedom versus security story because it's right here going on in our backyard, more people are going to be engaged. Period. More people are going to be engaged. Thank you so much, Bill. I think we'd all like to say thank you.